All right, well, let's uh, make a start, shall we? So, uh, look, thank you, everyone, for attending uh, today's webinar. So, my name's James McGregor, as you would have seen in the flyer that came out. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about uh, delivering uh, research impact. Now, when we all uh, start off on our journeys and research projects, uh, I guess we all have dreams, like this kid here in front of us, of taking our idea through to um, some sort of uh, reality and actually delivering some positive outcome, and particularly uh, for us working in uh, the sustainability space where we're looking at you know, delivering research outcomes uh, particularly for our low carbon cities or low carbon living uh, that deliver environmental or positive social impacts. Um, we always want to get, get those ideas uh, out into uh, the real world. And having worked in R&D for almost 15 years now uh, with when I was with CSIRO, I'd, I'd often come involved in projects very late in the piece. So they'd been through the laboratory phase and they were moving in towards uh, getting close to going to market. And one of the questions that uh, I always asked when I took over these projects was, well, who were you designing this for and what was the, the market you were targeting? So what we're going to cover off today's in today's webinar is how do we actually define some sort of path to market? Now, ideally, that should occur uh, at the start of your uh, research work, uh, but it can happen at any, at any time during the life cycle. And, uh, otherwise, we end up with developing you see these two pictures here. So these are some of the I guess, silly inventions that are created um, over time, and these are solutions to a problem that don't exist. Um, so yeah, no one really wants to strap, strap a set of wings to their back and fly a rocket to go to work. And the uh, image there on the right is a portable TV glasses. Although now we have Google Glass and VR, uh, maybe that guy was well ahead of his uh, time. And often the mistake that um, we make is that we start designing a solution and we go looking for a problem, uh, when in fact what we need to do is think about in the other way around. So the first thing to do in terms of delivering impact from your research is to is actually understand the problem and, and the problem for whom. Uh, and this is not the research question that you're trying to solve or the particular research outcome for the project. This is the, the problem that the uh, stakeholders or the end users or the customers who are going to use your research and, and employ that, that's the problem that they're trying to solve. Now I went looking for a whole lot of research around um, research outcomes and where those that were successful or not uh, and there's no surprise, there's no data um, and anecdotal evidence from my experience in working in R&D and sure everyone else's where we've seen uh, awesome research outcomes uh, sit on the shelf and gather dust. But one uh, analogous sector uh, to R&D is the startup sector. Uh, and there's lots of lots of data around that over the last 40 years, looking at startup companies, uh, what makes them fail, what makes them succeed, uh, and everything in between. And you, know, you hear the uh, urban myth of nine out of 10 startups fail. And so that number, there's actually no data to back up that number. It's more somewhere between 60 and 75%. So uh, a study done uh, only about two years ago uh, by the Harvard Business School found that there's 75% of venture-backed startups fail. Uh, and so I'll, I'm talking about startups because I think they have a lot of analogies with R&D. Uh, startups are trying to uh, develop uh, new new ideas um, and products and services in an environment of extreme uncertainty, so you don't never know necessarily what the outcome is going to be. Uh, and some of those ideas can be quite disruptive. So working in the low carbon environment, uh, we're looking to really disrupt all those business models that exist out there at the moment. So I think there's some, some good parallels. Uh, and one of the um, research studies looked at why startups fail. Uh, and the number one reason, by a country mile, uh, and 42% of startups that had failed, uh, and this is a survey of around 300 companies, um, because there was no need for their product. So what they had done, they created a solution looking for a problem in trying to, instead of trying to solve a problem. So using this framework, so for today we're going to use um, a framework to identify core key problems that your um, stakeholders or the people who are going, the end users of your research uh, are trying to solve. Uh, and there are typically three types of problems that we're all, all trying to solve, right? Um, there's the ex external problem. So this is the, the job that you're trying to do. So you're trying to complete a research report or you're trying to uh, get from A to B if you're talking about transport. Then there's the internal problems. So in, and internal problems are how we feel about things. 
So these are typically uh, what keeps us up at night, what, what worries us, um, and um, it's how, our, how we feel about all the barriers that we go to solving that external problem. And then we have philosophical problems. So these are things related to values. So you know, I believe that winning is better than losing, or uh, I think that every business should make a positive contribution to the environment. So there's a really simple example. So say, say for example, I wanted to lose weight. Right? So my external problem might be that I want to lose five kilograms. My internal problem is that I just want to feel good about myself. All right, or I want to be able to keep up with the kids, and I don't want to feel like a um, a slob chasing after the kids around around the playground. And my philosophical problem is that look, I believe that a healthy healthy lifestyle is important. So if you were trying to to sell me a research solution to help me lose weight, do you think the messaging saying um, if you do A, B, and C, um, then you'll lose five kilograms? Okay, so. You know, that particular approach didn't particularly work well for smoking. Don't smoke or you will die, all right? And people still smoke. Don't text and drive because you will crash your car. Um, so those sorts of external solving, the job that people are doing is not necessarily why people choose things. If you were to tell me, hey, hey we're going to do this exercise program, you feel you get lots of endorphins, it's going to feel really good, you're going to be able to um, have, um, have a great time. Um, that's the feel-good part. And by the way, you might lose some weight along the way. So. Most people make decisions based on the internal problem they're trying to solve. And we'll look at a case study uh, shortly to actually demonstrate that. The next step is to design a solution. So this is what we call the values map. Um, and the idea is, is to match the um, features or the solutions that your research provides to those, problem, those three types of problems that our stakeholders or customers are trying to solve. So the first part is features, you know, what, what does your research do? I've got a widget that um, proves the efficiency of solar panels on the roof. Uh, and then we look at pain relievers. So how do we solve those internal problems? So what uh, benefits do we get from uh, our research that solves those internal problems? And a really good way to do that is to uh, write down all the features of your research and ask the question, which means? So uh, for example, I have a uh, technology that uh, improves efficiency of solar panels on your, on your roof, which means that your solar panels will produce more electricity, which means that you don't have to pay as much on your energy bill each month, which means that you don't have to stress about um, putting food on the table or paying for your electricity bill, which is the internal problem we're trying to solve. So if you keep asking that question, you'll eventually get to what are the pain relievers. And then the gain, gain creators are those that um, benefits we gain that uh, speak to someone's uh, value set. So if someone's uh, particularly pro the environment, so uh, putting improved solar panels on their roof means that they can help the environment. Maybe it's they want to be seen as successful um, and therefore they um, go want to see solar panels in the home so people think that they're, they're a success in their neighbourhood. And uh, on to that point, what we'll do is just going to do a quick poll now. I uh, apologise for this jumping around because we had the power company turning power on and off our place this morning. So to drop around. So I'm going to do, I'm just going to put up a bit of a poll and get everyone to answer that. So that should be coming up on the screen now. So what I want you to do is tell me which of these factors do you think has the most influence on a person's decision to install solar photovoltaics on their home? So let's go ahead and click on that and then we'll uh, move on and look at our case study. All right. There you go. Well, obviously made my teaching point correct because we have 60% believe that that's because our neighbours, because their neighbours installed solar panels recently. 33% um, have said that they they want a desire to save energy and 7% the opportunity to go off grid. And in fact, a study done by Yale University and New York, uh, University of New York uh, or NYC uh, found that people are eight times more likely to install solar panels on their home uh, if a neighbour has installed solar panels on their home in the last six months. And interestingly, that, that factor um, applies less in wealthy neighbourhoods where people's homes are set back further from the street, people can't see the solar panels. And what's driving that is that uh, it's a status symbol. So people, the social drivers are actually driving it, which is this internal problem. I want, I want to be seen as successful by my neighbours, I want to be part of the social network, uh, and they're the saving the environment and reducing energy are sort of secondary factors uh, to that um, decision that those people make. So 
the process we use to capture and understand the value proposition that we make is we use a tool called the Business Model Canvas. So, so next week at the uh, CRC forum, so we'll be there's a researchers workshop uh, in the last two hours of day one uh, where we'll be actually expanding on what we're talking about in today's webinar. And what we're going to use is use this tool, which is um, a tool to actually capture all the various assumptions around how you're going to get your research uh, to deliver to your end users or your stakeholders. So the business model, the conventional business model canvas is comprised of nine components, and then we add two additional ones for sustainability-related aspects. So the first key aspect is our value proposition, and what we're going to do is focus just on these four for the time being. So the first one is our value proposition. So this is the um, the, the features or the value that your research creates for a particular customer segment or a particular stakeholder. On the right-hand side there, we have our customer segment. So these are the various stakeholders um, or end users that are going to benefit from your research. Channels represents how do we get our value proposition from uh, the, our research through to our customer segment. So if, for example, if it's a widget, maybe that's for a retail channel. Maybe it's through licensing to a company that distributes products and services. And then the top one there is our customer relationship. So this is how do we actually find, keep, and grow um, those stakeholders who, and expand on people utilising our research. And when we get look, think about our problem map that we created for our customers earlier and our uh, value map, uh, the idea is to, and that sits in those two categories. So the, the value map represents the key features of our value proposition and on the right hand side represents the problems of our customer segments. And we can have multiple customers and multiple stakeholders that can benefit from our research. So let's go and look at a bit of a case study to sort of reinforce some of these ideas. So you would have seen this uh, about a, a PhD researcher who ended up using a smiling fish to deliver a particular um, positive impact for um, communities in Cambodia. So, so this is Christopher. So Christopher Charles um, received a scholarship to go and work with NGOs um, for a year. Uh, and he, this is prior to doing his PhD, and in the end he elected to go work with an NGO working in Cambodia trying to solve this problem. So one of the biggest problems um, in the health system in Cambodia is that 60% um, of pregnant women are anemic, uh, and they're anemic because they don't have enough iron in their diet. Um, so it's the most widespread uh, nutritional disorder uh, in the country, uh, it's affecting 44%. 44 percent of the population uh, and the consequence of having not enough iron in their diet was that they were you know, they hemorrhage during childbirth, um, they have a lot of premature labours and it also affects the ongoing health uh, of the children. Now in the work that uh, Christopher did, um, the research identified actually quite ready solutions uh, to this problem and in fact what the research showed and what the researchers decided was a great way to go was that uh, if you actually use cast iron cookware um, the uh, iron um, diffuses into the water, iron particles go into the water, you ingest that when you consume the food that you're cooking in the cookware uh, and it increases the iron level in your blood and solves the anemia problem. Or alternatively you could eat more red meat. But if we look at the particular customer problems uh, for that segment, one of the challenges for the um, target market for the people who wanted to utilise that research was that they, their income was less than a dollar a day. So going out and buying brand new cast iron cookware or purchasing red meat, uh, which is really extremely expensive and very hard to come by, uh, simply wasn't a workable solution. So Christopher and the team came up with a uh, really simple idea. Why don't we get an iron disc, um, so just a cast iron um, token, and that gets thrown into the pot uh, and gets cooked with the food and had exactly the same effect as the cast iron pots. Um, so they, they did some lab work on that, they proved that it would work, they went out, uh, asked the uh, women who probably did the cooking in these villages to uh, include this, and I remember they were trying to also increase the, the uh, iron levels in the blood for um, pregnant women in particular, uh, and no one used it. Uh, and so they were scratching their heads thinking it's not, no, it's just it's just an iron disc, what, it solves the problem, it, it solves the problem that they were trying to solve, but it didn't solve a problem for the particular customer segment. So they tried changing those iron ingots into the shape of a lotus flower uh, and got the same result. People were really reluctant to use it. Um, they were a bit embarrassed about having to use it and it just didn't work. Even though the research was saying this would be the perfect solution to 
the problem, the perfect solution to the problem they were trying to solve, not the problem that their target stakeholders were needing to solve. And Christopher came across um, this, what we call the lucky iron fish. So there was a, a particular fish species uh, in discussion with the village elders that was a symbol of good luck. And so there were, you, know, you go down to the local markets, you could buy uh, charms and talismans that people would give as gifts um, as, a, as a sign of good luck, health and happiness in the local folklore. So thinking about this, I decided, okay, why don't we make uh, the iron, might we make an iron fish instead of an iron token? Uh, so, and this particular this particular solution was immediately received positively by the villagers. Um, it had an immediate impact on increasing blood iron levels, and in the village they did the trial on, anemia was virtually eliminated from the village. So, the question we have to ask ourselves: It's the same research solution. We're putting an iron uh, object um, into the cooking, yet one solution worked and one didn't. So, let's dive into our values map. Uh, and so we asked the question, you know, why did this work so well and everything else didn't? So if we look at our values map and our problem map for our customer profile, um, here's some of the, on the right hand side we can see some of the key concerns of the women living in these villages, right? So in the external problems, they were trying to get their daily chores done, right? So um, cooking was a major chore, you know, collecting water and generating income typically through agriculture uh, in a lot of these villages. So we see the alignment there on the features on the left. So yes, it can be used in cooking. It was designed to serve you that. So it may, maybe we tentatively could say we've created a solution there. But if we look at the internal problems, um, sure, they're concerned about their health because if they're sick and unwell, um, they can't actually work. Therefore, they can't earn an income, uh, which means that that feeds into some of these other worries around now. How do they feed their family? But also because these um, particular communities uh, were very, very poor, one characteristic in the social scientists who are on this, um, are listening to this webinar will probably understand this, when people are in a survival mode, um, you know, human beings have grown up in uh, communities um, as part of a survival mechanism, so there's safety in numbers. So particularly people who are living uh, in very poor conditions, the, the desire to um, conform socially is a really, really strong desire. And those social bonds around, you know, a community raises their children uh, are really, really important and internal issues. So they don't want to do anything that makes them seem like a misfit or anything odd that would put them on the outer for that social network. Philosophically, they also had the superstitions that they believed in. So you can see there that the actual pain relievers of the salute, this is for the token uh, or even the lotus flower option, uh, look, it could, could improve their health. So it was you know, quite, only a couple of really touch points and they're really tentative. You know, the, the, the reality is that the women in the village weren't trying to solve their blood iron levels. Uh, it's not language they would use. They just wanted to stay healthy. By contrast, if we have a look at what the iron fish was able to deliver, um, so on the right hand side we have exactly the same set of problems. So you know, trying to create income, daily chores, believe in superstitions, you know, worried about feeding the family and social conformity. Introducing the fish um, shaped ingot um, created a whole lot of new values that aligned with those problems. So uh, we still have the same ones where it can be used in cooking, it can increase blood iron levels in terms of features of the solution. Uh, but creating it as a fish meant that now people could give it as a gift. Um, it was a socially acceptable symbol because of their, their local folklore. Um, you know, putting this into your food, into your pot and cooking with it made perfect sense because it would deliver good luck. Um, so that fed into the local superstitions. Um, so it touched all those internal problems and therefore was much more readily accepted um, by the, uh, the women in the village and therefore it um, was used and the research team was able to, able to deliver amazing impact. It basically eliminated anemia uh, within that village, simply by making by making sure that the value proposition or the the, the values created through their solution uh, ultimately uh, aligned with the problems that the end users that they wanted to utilise their research um, it was all aligned. So and you can see see all those connections there. So so that sort of reinforces why it's really important to understand your stakeholders and understand the problems that they are trying to solve not the research problem that you're trying to solve, because sometimes they're, they're not the one and the same thing. So I guess this brings us towards the, the end of the, the webinar part, and then we'll put it up for questions for if people want to ask some questions. So what can you do 
to um, take your research to the next step. So, so the process I've just discussed there is um, part of a process that we use for um, environmental or social um, projects or initiatives with our clients. And it doesn't matter whether it's a research project or a large corporate trying to implement a major sustainability initiative. And we go through uh, a process that we see here. And this is a process that's been adapted from uh, tech, tech startup companies out of Silicon Valley. Uh, and it's an engineered process. So companies like um, Airbnb or even Facebook um, have used a blah blah car as well as example have used this exact process to, to launch their companies and scale their companies. And you notice the word customer comes up in pretty much every stage. So, and this is, it's all about understanding um, what your customers' problems are and aligning your research outcomes to map those map to those customer problems. So the first phase that we, we've been discussing today is this idea of customer uh, discovery. And this is where we um, go out to try to identify product market fit or product solution fit. So, and this is really all about understanding the end users, the stakeholders, what problems they're trying to solve, and then trying to see how you can align your research outcomes to solve those particular problems or package your research outcomes in a way that they understand how it can solve those particular problems. And really what we've done today is really just touched on phase one of that customer discovery process. Next week at the annual forum, uh, what we're going to do is um, continue on with that customer discovery process and what we'll end up at the end of that two hour uh, workshop, uh, you'll go away with a full um, customer discovery plan which will look at who are your customers, what, well, what problems do you assume, so these are the hypotheses that you're going to identify, um, we're going to identify how we can, we're going to map the value proposition for your research to solving those problems, but we'll also look at how you're going to deliver, so ways you can deliver through the various channels and how you're actually going to make people aware of your research and you'll go away with a bit of a plan and you can go away and then test the problem which means getting out of the building and actually talking to real stakeholders. So. What you can do from here, so at the end I'll show you some resources, a free download with some templates that you can go and have a think about this, but the first thing you do is identify the customer. So and by the customer you mean the stakeholders or the end users or the person who's actually going to utilise uh, your research. Next step is to create your customer profile. So go through and identify what are the jobs they're trying to get done, uh, what are the internal problems and in the um, download you'll be able to get. Uh, I'll show you the link and then we'll also send that out as an email. Um, there's a whole lot of trigger questions you can ask about that particular customers um, and you'll map the internal problems as well as their philosophical problems that they're trying to solve. You then need to list all the features of your research uh, and a good tip here is one I mentioned at the start is write down all the various features about what, what you think your widget or your product or your research delivers and ask the question which means after each one of those and eventually you ask that which means, which means, which means, you'll eventually get to a point where you can actually start to understand how um, it will align with um, you know, pain relievers, so solving those internal problems for your customers or supporting their uh, philosophical problems. And step four is the most important step. Um, all, all of this exercise that you'll do up until that point is all just assumptions until you actually get out and speak to real stakeholders and real people who are going to actually use your research. So you need to get out of the building and actually go and talk to them and find out what problems they're facing and validate all those assumptions uh, that you've just made. So one last thing, so there's a couple of resources, so we'll send this out as an email also uh, at the end. Um, so there's a free guide that you can download which will take you through that entire process of creating your customer profiles as well as your value maps uh, and a series of trigger questions in there to help you out with that exercise. So if you just go down, just go to that website, um, you'll be able to download that. Um, if you want to learn more about the Business Model Canvas, uh, there's a YouTube video that we've put together uh, which explains all the various components, um, so you can learn a little bit more about that. And alternatively, feel free to uh, reach out and uh, contact me if you uh, want to learn more or if you've got any, any particular questions. So, so that concludes the presentation part of the webinar. Um, so if people got any particular questions, you can throw them up in the comments section now and then we'll work through those and if uh, they start the Twitter out then we'll uh, call the webinar to a close. So if any questions um, start throwing them into the uh, comments box now and I'll be able to see them come up on the screen. Okay so this is from Tanya, so what do we need to do to prepare for the workshop uh, next week? So a good start would be to um, think about your stakeholders, so what we, the exercise we're going to do at the workshop next week is to basically map out what we've just talked about there. 
but thinking about who might be the end user of your research or who would benefit from your research, so come out with a list of those people, and start thinking about um, you know, the jobs, the in, external, internal, and philosophical problems they might be trying to solve. It will all be uh, assumptions at this stage, but if you go through the exercise, get that download, fill out those templates, that would be a really good start uh, for next week. Uh, and then that's it, and then we'll actually go through the rest of it while we're actually at, at the um, workshop. So there's a comment there from Jess about the solar PV study. Yes, I'll send you through a link to that. Um, and there's actually two studies by Yale um, on the same topic. One's more around technology diffusion, but it basically shows the same result. One shows eight times, people are eight times more likely to install solar panels if they uh, live within one mile of someone who's just installed panels in the last six months. And the other one showed about five times, different suburbs, but consistent result. So we've got another one from uh, Sorma. What if the customer is the government? Well, so in so a lot of my customers are government, uh, and the remember, thing to remember is the customer is not the government. The customer is the people who work inside the government, and they they're facing their, all their own internal, external, and philosophical problems. Um, so sometimes their internal problem is they uh, need to make sure they don't do anything stupid to en embarrass the minister. Uh, maybe they need they need to bring up a find something really innovative and a good news story that they can uh, announce, uh, and it could just be that their your research in particular helps them uh, deliver a policy outcome that they're struggling with at the moment. So, so again, you need to think about um, not the, uh, your customer as these large organisations, but they're, they're organisations of people, uh, and you can categorise you know, different you now for people in the finance department, trying to do it, people in policy development. Uh, people in marketing are trying to do particular things, and they all have their own uh, external, internal, and philosophical problems. So that's probably the um, most important thing to remember. Okay, so so Stephen Stephen Summer has come a good suggestion there. So for those who um, have a particular research which you might be struggling to understand, maybe just post the problem up to the group and then we can maybe talk through a couple of ideas around if you've got a particular issue or you're struggling to understand how you might do this for your work. Um, comment here from David. What would you say about situations where there are multiple pathways concurrently, i.e. discrete value propositions for different audience segments? Uh, so yeah, you can. There are definitely cases where your research will deliver a different benefit to a different customer segment, and that comes down to um, packaging. Uh, and actually, I'll give think of a think of an example. So, if we think about installing solar panels on roofs, so we just talk about value sets. So typically, um, people fall into three value classes. So there's what uh, what we would refer to as settlers. So these are people who are driven by safety and security. These are people who you know, probably lived in the same neighbourhood their whole life. They go on holidays to the same place. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're afraid of change, um, those sorts of things. And you've got what we would call prospectors. So these are people who are they want the biggest and the best and the greatest. Some want to have a shiny car, and they're seeking the esteem of others. And then there's pioneers, and they're people who make decisions based on their own internal ethics and values. So if we're talking about solar panels on roofs, so um, Pioneers would be interested in uh, having, um, you know, doing something good for the world, and so the same same product or widget, uh, you'd have to use different language to communicate that. Then prospectors would all about, they want to make sure that everyone in the street could see that they'd put solar panels in their home, so they're highly visible. It's about having the latest text, like uh, having the latest iPhone, and then settlers are all, all about safety and security and and making sure that my energy bills um, are, are under control and I'm I'm not going to have to trade off paying the energy or um, putting food on the table. Uh, typically settlers in the lagged category. So, so yes, so for one particular um, set of features of your research, there could be multiple segments, customer segments that um, can get gain different value and then you, it's how you, what channel you deliver it through and what sort of relationship you have with them is how you actually differentiate it. Jane, so this is from Catherine. Ideally, with what point of research design do you recommend we adopt this plan? Perhaps the earlier the better. Absolutely. Um, so ideally, when you start out on day one of your research plan, you need to be thinking about how you're going to deliver impact and how you might commercialise or who the end user is going to be. 
because um, that will help you make, particularly as you're going through your research where you get to a, a TNS section where you've got to go one way or another with the research, it also provides you lots of clarity around uh, what's the best way to go uh, if you understand the problems you're trying to solve. So, uh, But it's never too late. As I said, a lot of the projects when I was at CSIRO, um, I would get involved very late in the piece uh, and we might have to completely re-engineer how we package the solution. So as an example, uh, I had a technology that was being developed for producing hot, using solar thermal energy to produce hydrogen and the view was that you would produce this hydrogen, send it down the existing gas pipelines, burn it in turbines to produce um, renewable electricity. Uh, however, when you dug into it, there's really no solar and batteries and uh, wind um, were far cheaper, easier, more convenient and that particular solution wasn't provide, solving a problem that anyone wanted. So when I looked at that one, the actual hydrogen molecule was highly valuable for certain industrial processes like uh, uh, producing ammonia. Uh, and so we completely repackaged the research, um, changed the value proposition for it and started and commercialized that successfully uh, through uh, industrial chemicals. So even though the original solution the research team were trying to solve was around electricity production. So, um, so you can do it later in the piece, but much, much easier if you uh, do it up front. Um, so Tanya, so, so are you saying drill down to the individual? So t yes, <laughs> that's the short answer. Well, we, dr we drill down into avatars. So in, in large populations of people, um, you can generally create um, avatars that represent a larger group. So it doesn't have to be the, you know, you know Joe Smith down the road who um, likes, loves Game of Thrones and um, rides a bike to work every day. Um, it's not down to that level, so you can create it down to populations of people who have similar characteristics um, or behaviours is probably the way to do it. Um, if you're talking about targeting a particular organisation, say like a government department, then yes, you can actually go down to individuals or if it's an internal uh, strategy you're trying to implement within a company, um, then yeah, understanding the, CF, what, understanding the CFO's internal, external and philosophical problems uh, can be a really, really powerful way to actually get your um, uh, idea through. So another one from David, how might this apply when a situation is broad, societal level rather than specific individuals? So I think I'll probably just cover that in the last question. So yeah, you try to categorise your customers into different avatars and types of people uh, rather than down to individuals. What is the role of behavioural economics in all this from Stephen Summerhay? So look, I think it's behavioural economics is a tool to help you understand um, how your research could be delivered. Um, but unless you're an expert in that area, it, I think it becomes it overcomplicates things in terms of the process needed. I think simply doing the thought exercise um, after today's webinar of, okay, who, who's the stakeholder, who might be then using my research and what are the problems they're trying to solve? I think that's a far more powerful and beneficial thing to your research because you've got a million other things going on in your life uh, without becoming a behavioural economics expert. Uh, but certainly when we start getting into um, larger scale deployments and commercialization of the technology in terms of scaling the technology, so in the model I gave before and had you know, customer discovery, customer validation, uh, and then customer development. So during the customer development phase, that's where you're trying to scale your solution and get widespread adoption. That's where behavioral economics becomes a powerful tool for your marketing strategy. Really. From Tom Hayes, does your process allow for exploration of how we might be projecting our understanding of our clients on our clients' beliefs, how are these potential cultural differences explored in the process? So yeah, so that's um, a really important thing and that's why we always start by assuming that the map we've created is, is simply a series of assumptions um, because we all, we all bring our own um, natural biases, so these might be our intellectual biases, might be cultural biases to our interpretation of our customer problems. So, if we go back to the lucky iron fish example, um, so the team there was scratching their heads thinking, well, just throw it in the pot, how high can that be? It'll fix your iron levels, um, you, you should be really happy with us. But culturally, um, that was seen as an embarrassing thing to do, which is why they didn't put the chunk of metal in their, in their pot. When it was the shape of a fish, that was cult culturally acceptable, so people weren't embarrassed by it and it made perfect sense and they didn't feel like they were doing something odd uh, within the group. So. Um, but they didn't learn that until they actually went out into the field and actually spoke to them. So that's why that last step I mentioned in terms of get out of the building and actually talk to your stakeholders. 
uh, is a really important part of that um, process. Uh, let's next one. So we got Tom, for example, in the presentation was an assumption that the Cambodian value beliefs were superstitions. Um, so well, superstitions is the term I used. Um, there, was, there wasn't an assumption in that, in that case when they selected the design uh, of the particular fish and the, the symbology used on that fish. Um, that was based on uh, the actual uh, good luck charms that people were already purchasing and giving as gifts uh, within that village. Um, maybe superstitions is the wrong word, but they certainly had beliefs that if you gave someone this particular um, token talisman uh, symbol, uh, that it was a symbol of uh, good luck. So, and I only learnt that by, as I said in the last step, the important thing of actually going out and talking to people to understand their problems. It wasn't until I actually spoke to the village elders that they got a better understanding of that particular uh, problem. Um, so this one's from Tommy. Hey Tommy, um, how do you link a problem solution for one organisation to a wider group, for example, conducting the research in one organisation and then looking to broaden it to test with other similar organisations. So, so typically when we go out and test the problem, so there's two things you've got to test. So the first one is you're testing your assumptions around what is the problem that people are trying to solve and then there's testing that the solution that you have is something that they want. Uh, and typically we would try to speak to at least 50 uh, people who are representative of our target market um, in order to get a representative sample. So speaking to one organisation is, uh, you're right, that, that gives you a snapshot, uh, but what you actually need to do is actually start getting the same signals. Now when you're onto something really good, you'll start finding people say, I really need that now, and everyone you speak to will start telling you the same thing. Um, so um, it's important to actually talk, uh, talk to as many people as possible, and what you need to do is just program in your diary, and this week I'm going to speak to five people about this problem. And over time, really what you're trying to do is get, establish empathy for your stakeholders and the problems they're trying to solve. And as you start to, the more and more people you start to speak to, you you actually start to be able to guess what the responses are going to be because you'll start to understand them better. Uh, so from Tanya, how do these series differ mirror marketing concepts? Are they targeted against product placement? Do they come from the same basis? Uh, yeah, so there's... Uh, very strong linkages with uh, marketing, understanding uh, how to get people to purchase products and services um, to this. So the way I differ, then marketing is, for me, marketing is about going out and promoting a product or a service that um, addresses, in, in language that addresses those, particularly those internal problems. Uh, and marketing comes after the customer discovery. So you need to actually understand what those problems are and then you, your marketing campaign goes and, um, for example, there's a, if you go, for those who want to go, go to a website, there's an article there, a blog on my website called, um, called What the Squatty Potty uh, Can Teach Us About Selling Sustainability. It actually goes through a sales process. And one of the steps is once you identify the problem, uh, one of the big things in marketing is you agitate the problem. So uh, you, you point out all the really bad things that can happen if you don't solve this problem. So marketing sort of takes the customer discovery process and employs that to get people to actually buy into your uh, concept. So that, there's a very strong linkage uh, and they all um, uh, sit on the back of the same behavioural um, type issues uh, and the way people um, make decisions. Uh, so next we go. Well, yeah, perhaps culture instead of superstition. Yes, yeah, good tip, thanks. I'll uh, adjust the presentation on that one. Uh, last one, so probably a lot of time for the last question from David. Does this approach involve additional primary research? Is market testing, is it market testing rather than research that is currently underway? Assessing we do another round of research, no. So, so this is something that you will do piecemeal across the life of your research program. So. Um, so if you're doing a PhD, you need to start out at least, at least with some concept of what's the value you think you're going to create from your research uh, and who's going to use it. And as you go through that um, research journey, you'll have opportunities to test that. So this is not something you're going to go out and it, it's an iteration process. You're never going to get this right on day one um, because your research uh, is also going to change a lot from the from the day you start your research. You know, the best best laid research plan never survives first contact. Uh, with researchers in my experience uh, and the same with a um, customer discovery process. You know, the best product and service never, or best 
uh, business model never survives contact with first customers. So um, this is a, a iteration process, has lots of similarities. If you're going to do this properly, what you do is actually design a series of little experiments over the life of the research. We actually go out and test your assumptions around customers and customer discovery uh, and use that feedback to then um, adjust, pivot. Um, and th that's how we would do it. So. Uh, so no, so this is not a, another round of heavy research. Um, I think the most powerful thing to deliver impact is to make sure you at least got in the back of your mind who's going to use it and how are they going to use it and what problems am I solving for them. And I think if you even just do that one one simple step, um, your research has a, um, you will, you will find you'll identify opportunities to deliver that impact um, that normally you probably would have missed because at least you, you're aware of how you're going to deliver that research impact. Um, but importantly, um, if you if just going through the thought exercise of thinking about how someone's going to package it up, we'll, get, we'll make sure that when you, whether you realise it or not, when you get to the end of your research, you've actually got a plan and a path to market, uh, and you'll likely deliver much more impact than your research uh, in doing it that way. So sadly, that's uh, end of our um, time today. So I know everyone's busy; you need to get back to what they're doing. So look, thank you, everyone, for participating. Um, I'll be down at the forum next week. I uh, hope to see a lot of you, for those who are there, a lot of the research uh, workshop will actually take this to a lot uh, higher detail and you actually go away with a customer discovery plan. And so it gets to that last comment, David, you know, we can, we'll can we do that in a two-hour two hour exercise, all right? So we're not talking huge amounts of time, um, but it's making sure that you're at least conscious of thinking about how you actually deliver impact from your research. And yeah, thanks for joining in and uh, we'll see some of you hopefully next week. And uh, yeah, feel free to reach out to that email address and we'll send out some of these resources via email. And uh, look, I hope everyone gained um, some useful tips on uh, how you can uh, go out and change the world one uh, research project at a time. So thanks for joining.